Wouldn't it be so cool to use the GMAT's own rules against it? There's a rule that says that the statements in data sufficiency have to tell the truth. And we can use that to both catch ourselves when we make a mistake and solve particularly difficult data sufficiency questions very quickly. So I'll start by showing you a few questions that I created myself. They're fairly simple, but people tend to make careless mistakes on them. And we can use this rule to help ourselves catch those mistakes. Then we'll switch over to a particularly difficult official GMAT data sufficiency question, and I'll show you how we can use this rule to really simplify our workflow and get to the answer much quicker. So let's dive in. In this first question, it's a yes, no data sufficiency question. They're asking, is x negative? And with statement one, what might happen to us is we'll just take the square root of both sides, forgetting about the negative option and just making the inference that x is greater than one. And we would say, okay, this is sufficient. This statement tells us definitively that no, x is not negative. So statement one gives us a definitive no. Then we go to statement two and we'd say, this one is also sufficient. This one tells us that x is less than negative two. Well, then it must be negative. So statement two gives us a definitive yes. Now this is where we have to catch ourselves and say, wait a minute. It's not possible on the GMAT that statement one would lead to a definitive no and statement two would lead to a definitive yes because that means that somebody is lying and the statements are not allowed to lie. So this is a way for me to realize, wait a minute, I must have made a mistake somewhere. I go check my work and then hopefully I realize I did something illegal here when I took the square root of both sides for statement one and forgot about the negative possibility. Of course, the correct way to simplify statement one is to say, hey, if x squared is greater than one, then x must be more than one unit away from zero. So when we take the square root of both sides, we would just have to talk about distances from zero as opposed to just assuming that it's positive. So x is more than one away from zero. Now we can say that these statements no longer contradict one another, right? x could be anywhere to the left of negative one or anywhere to the right of positive one, then statement two tells us it's actually to the left of negative two, which is possible given the information from statement one. So let's move on to another example. In this one, I have a value data sufficiency question. It's asking for the value of x. Now, going into statement one, I see a lot of people making the mistake, sim very similar mistake to the previous example, where they would forget about the negative possibility and they would just say, okay, if x squared is nine, x must be three. They would say this is sufficient, it gives me a definitive answer, x is three. Then we go to statement two and we say, hey, if x cubed is negative 27, then x must be negative three. So this is also sufficient on its own, it gives me a definitive value for x. But this is where we have to catch ourselves, right? It's not possible that statement one is sufficient and gives us the answer three, and statement two is also sufficient but gives us a different answer, negative three. That can't happen in the GMAT, so again, an opportunity for us to catch our mistake, go back, check our work, and hopefully realize, wait a minute, if x squared is nine, that means that x is either three or negative three, so now statement one allows for the possibility of negative three, and that, of course, is possible in the context of statement two. One more example, and then we'll switch to the actual GMAT question. So we're back to a yes, no data sufficiency question. This is a little bit more sophisticated. It's asking, is positive integer x? And we should note here that that's a big piece of information that's hiding inside there, right? X is not just any value, x is some positive integer. Is that positive integer greater than five? Now, we definitely recommend starting with statement two because it seems much simpler to evaluate. Statement two tells us that it's less than six, and given that it's a positive integer, then it can't be greater than five, because if you're gonna be greater than five and you're a positive integer, you'd have to be at least six. But statement two tells us, no, no, we're less than six. So we'd say that statement two gives us a definitive no. Right? Knowing that statement two is true, knowing that x is a positive integer, we can say definitively, no, x is not greater than five. And then we go to statement one, and we're told that the median of this set, we've got a set of three numbers, and the median is five. The correct inference is to say that x is at least five. It could be that the set is 
three, five, five, and then indeed the median would be five. But the mistake that most people would make here is they would say, oh, the, uh, the value of x has to be at least six, because they're failing to consider the scenario in which the median is repeated. So if we make that mistake and we say, based on this set and based on the fact that five is the median of the set, x has to be at least six, then we would say this is sufficient on its own. It gives us a definitive yes, x is greater than five, because if x is at least six, that means it's greater than five. But again, this is an opportunity for us to catch our mistake because we decided statement two gave us a definitive no, and statement one gives us a definitive yes, and that can't happen on the GMAT. So we have to go back and check our work and hopefully you realize, oh, wait a minute, statement one does allow for the possibility of a no, in the event that x equals 5. So it has to at least allow for the possibility of what statement 2 was sufficient to provide. So let's look at a really difficult official GMAT question right after the intro. All right, so now let's go to an official GMAT question. I do recommend that you pause the video here, try this question on your own, and then come back and watch the rest of the video. So this is another yes, no data sufficiency question, and I can tell based on the word did, right? Either it did or it didn't, yes, no question. So apparently we have a landscaping job that takes more than four hours, and for those first four hours, the contractor charges R. So we can draw a graph here and say, you know, as the time goes on, we'll use the x-axis for time, as the hours go by, the cost starts from R and, and stays at R as we go closer and closer to four hours. Once we pass four hours, the cost jumps to 1.2 R until we reach five hours. Then it jumps again to 1.4 R until we reach six hours and so on. So every hour that goes by, it goes up by 0.2 R. It's this stepwise type graph. And the question wants to know whether or not the job took more than 10 hours. Now using my graph, I might say, well, instead of asking, did it take more than 10 hours? We could just ask, did it cost more than 2.2 R? Because that's where we'd be at 10 hours. So if it's more than 10 hours, it's gonna cost at least 2.4 R. But if it's up to 10 hours, it'll cost 2.2 R or less. So really this question is asking, was it more than 2.2 R for the job? And statement two gives us a definitive answer. It says, yes, it was more than 2.2 R. In fact, it was 2.4 R. So I'd say that statement two is definitely sufficient on its own. And it gives us a definitive yes. And that's really important because we're gonna use that when we go to evaluate the more complicated statement, which is statement one. So we started with statement two. It was sufficient. It gave us a definitive yes. We can now use the data sufficiency rules to our advantage. We can say, hey, because statement two was sufficient on its own and led to a definitive yes, I know without having to test, I already know that statement one will at least allow for the possibility of a yes. Statement one is not going to lead to a definitive no, that's for sure, because if it did, we'd have a conflict between these statements and one of them would be lying and they're not allowed to lie. So I don't need to worry about showing that statement one allows for yes. If I want to try to prove insufficiency for statement one, all I have to do is show that it could lead to a no. If I can show that it can lead to a no, then statement one is not sufficient on its own. If I fail to show that it's possible to get a no, then statement one is also sufficient on its own and we would pick D. So let's see, let's think strategically about this. How can we show that statement one allows for the possibility of a no? Again, we don't need to show that it allows for the possibility of a yes, it has to allow for the possibility of a yes in order to not contradict statement two, which gave a definitive yes. 
So if I want statement one to lead to a no, I suppose all I would have to consider is a scenario in which R is exactly 288. And this is one of many scenarios that would lead to a no. But let me just confirm that R could be 288. What do we know about R? Oh, it's just greater than 100. So if it's greater than 100, sure, it could be 288. And if that's the case, then we would say that the job took no more than four hours. Because if it did take more than four hours, well, then it would cost more than 288. So this is a great, fairly easy way to show that statement one allows for the possibility of a no. And since we already knew that it allows for the possibility of a yes without actually having to check that, we can now conclude with very little work, really, we can conclude that statement one is not sufficient on its own and go ahead and pick B and move on to the next question. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.